Well, today is uh, part four, a passion worth sharing. I was uh, talking with the Sunday school class. Today is the last part of uh, our series, a uh, month-long series on evangelism. And I'm, I'm really excited to get to Luke. I'm really excited to get back into our weekly rhythm of going through the text. But there is so much uh, to share about evangelism. And I never, ever wanted this just to be like a course that's just a bunch of information. I'm hoping that each one of you is saying, what can I grab from this? What will help me be a more effective witness? Do I need to be motivated? Do I need to learn some techniques? Do I need to, to be encouraged through Scripture? Maybe it, I just haven't been convicted through Scripture that this is an important thing for me to be doing. Whatever it is, I hope that the Holy Spirit's been working on you through these last three weeks. Today's going to be our fourth week. And there is so much more we could have spoken on. But you know what? Uh, I kept it streamlined today. I didn't run off on all the different tangents. And, and we're going to be able to study those things as we go through our New Testament. They're going to come up again and again and again. First off, everybody, take a chill pill. Uh, relax. Sometimes we get so tight about uh, evangelism. And that's why I didn't use the term evangelism. It's a passion that's worth sharing. Share your passion. Talk If you love Jesus, talk about Jesus. Don't worry about being perfect. We don't save anybody anyways. God saves people. Uh, we don't need to be perfect, and, and we don't always have to be that last domino. Now, I want us today, we're going to talk about being ready to reap that harvest. Don't just keep talking and hope somebody else comes after you. Offer them an opportunity to pray with you. You can lead them into the family of Christ. But don't have all that pressure on you. Don't worry about just the right words. If Listen, I've, I've given up worrying about that a lot. Well, I wish I did. Sometimes it creeps back in. But for the most part, I've given up worrying about that a long time ago. If somebody is in a place in their life and they're encountering the Holy Spirit, they, they're still at that threshold where maybe they'll believe, maybe they won't, and that's their choice. But I found out that as long as I'm trying to be humble, and as long as I'm surrendering myself to God, I don't have to say just the right perfect words. The Holy Spirit is working with them. I just need to be his tool. I need to be willing it to work. So don't worry. Don't, don't have all the pressure like I need to have the magic formula. There is no magic formula. Don't worry like I need to be well, this, this super educated person. I need to have all the best apologetics. I need to explain everything perfectly. No. Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Our job is to speak forth the truth. Just speak. Just speak. And, and don't worry about the right technique. I've taught during these last three weeks, and I'm going to do it again today, some techniques. Remember the diagram of the, two, of the cliffs, the two cliffs? I think that's a wonderful technique. You can draw that on a napkin. You could grab a the back of an envelope. Anytime you're sitting with somebody, you could draw that on your hand. Here's one cliff. Here's the other cliff. Humans are over here, and we can't get over there no matter what we do. Our sin, this, this distance between the cliffs is our sin. We're never going to be good enough to get over there. But look at this. We can't get over there, but God can come over here. And then you draw a picture of a cross. When Jesus came to die for our sins, he built a bridge between the two cliffs, and now by faith we can walk across. and have. See, that's such an easy, I like that technique. You can use that. But there's no such thing as a, a magic technique or just the right technique. Uh, what we need to do is pray and love. I think uh, I've told you before that I don't think of myself as an evangelist, but I, I'm a good mule. I keep plotting, but I think what God's given me, and, and it wanes and it grows weak sometimes, I like people. In fact, I love people. I make friends easily. I don't look down at people. When people are different, when they're, uh, you know, all weird <laughs> looking different, in some ways, that never bothers me. And I always think, oh, you are precious and you're made in the image of God. And I want you in the family. Uh, brothers and sisters, before the Iraq War, the Middle East, 20% Christian. Lebanon is still over 40% Christian. In fact, because of the divide between Shiites and Sunnis, Christianity is still the largest uh, religion in Lebanon. Uh, before, you know, 20 years ago, Christianity 
was 20% of the Middle East. Today, because of persecution and hardship, it's, it's uh, 5%. And numerous sources that are familiar with the church globally and that have had a history working say the ch Christian church is under more persecution now than any other time in our lifetimes. In fact, more people are dying for their faith today than at the time of the Roman Empire. Ask God to give you a love in your heart for the people who are killing those Christians. Love people. Jesus would have died on the cross for them. They killed him. People killed Jesus, and he was praying for their salvation. We cannot be tools of the living God when we're filled up with indifference. I don't care. I got my own problems. We cannot be tools of the living God when we've got this barrier of bitterness and, and hatred within us. I want revival in the Middle East. I want Muslims to come to Jesus by the millions. I want to spend eternity with people who used to persecute Christians. I'm going to spend eternity with Paul. Remember? He was a Christian killer. What could give glory more to the living God than people who shook their fist at him than to fall on their knees before him in adoration? Amen. Amen. Let's love people. And, and, and we don't have this strength within us. We're weaklings. We need to pray. Don't overestimate your strength. We need to pray. Pray, Lord God, break my heart for the, my neighbor that I can't stand. Lord, I got some coworkers. All I do is think about how other jerks. Lord God, please give me love for them. Let me win their hearts so that I can win an opportunity to share Jesus Christ. I make it my ambition to show them grace and love. Fight for souls. Let's be a fierce church. Jesus said that not even the gates of hell will stand before his gospel, his church. Got to love the unlovely. Comfort the people that aren't too comfortable to be around. Bring light into some dark places. People have got a stereotype about Christians more in the United States than other places. Uh, of being hard-headed, critical, judgmental, filled with hate. You know what? That really doesn't sound like what Christ has called us to, does it? Let's, let's shock their expectations. Lord God, give us love. Father, please fill us up with love. The world knows how to be bitter, skeptical, angry, cynical, negative, spiteful. I don't need the Holy Spirit to know how to take revenge. I need the Spirit of the living God to bless and love people who have treated me very poorly. Last week, I, I shared a bunch of stories that I believe are not coincidence. I believe they were God working uh, to give me opportunities to share His Son, Jesus Christ, with people. Uh, those were success stories, and there were, there's actually a lot more stories I could have shared. Today I'd like to share with you some failures, and the reason I want to do that is twofold. One, just so you know that it doesn't always go the way you want to go. I think I've told you that of all the dozens and dozens of people that I've been able to pray with to, to bring them into a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, there's been many, many, many more people who have rejected what I had to say. But the other reason I want to share that with you is because we don't have to think of that as a failure. When we share the gospel, I believe that's a success. 
And when you come to me and say, yeah, I shared the gospel with my family, but they didn't listen. I say, no, you did the right thing. I always want to say you did the right thing. You fulfilled your mission. God says, scatter some seeds and you scattered them. What those hardheads do with it, <laughs> that's up to them. It's not a failure when we try to love people in the name of Jesus. It's not a failure when we shine the, the spotlight on the cross and say, here is salvation, here is eternal life, here is forgiveness. And somebody says, well, I'm not. And the thing is, we've been talking about this line of dominoes. Just because you're not the last domino doesn't mean God hasn't used you. And you may feel like you failed, but you kept that line going. And at some point, the preponderance of evidence is, as John Cook was saying, this tidal wave of truth overwhelms somebody and they give, they give in and they give up and they surrender to the living God. And you were a part of that. I can remember uh, there was three men uh, when I was living in a different city about 25 years ago, three men who were part of the local board of education. They were kind of big deals in their community, intelligent men. And... Uh, I was teaching them English and, and uh, Bible. And uh, we'd have a great class. They were funny. They liked me. I liked them. And, uh, and every time I'd come to the Bible part, they'd just kind of smirk like, yeah, superstitious. Yeah, this is cute, Dan. Religion. Mm -hmm. And then we'd talk, and sometimes they'd start to go like this. And, and you could see the gears working. And week after week, I, I, it was easy to predict, at the end of the Bible study, their defenses would be down, and they'd be thinking, is this, is this actually possible? Could this be real, that there is a God, that love is real, that I could be forgiven? And then the very next week, the smirk shields were up, as if that's a response. But the smirk shields were up. And, and I remember sometimes when one would be busy, or a couple of them would be busy, and one guy would be there, Sometimes these guys that when they're together, all they could do is smirk, would actually be in tears during the Bible study. But they could not allow themselves to believe. And to this day, I don't know if they've ever given themselves to Jesus Christ. You know what? I did the right thing anyways. I did the right thing anyways to keep loving them and to keep sharing Jesus Christ with them. Uh, I remember when I was in... I don't know if this was in high school or right after high school, but I, I got a bunch of my friends. And I brought them over to my Uncle Dan. He's a pastor. I brought them over to his house, and we were having a great time. And I was always trying to get my friends either to church or to my Christian friends, surrounded by Christian friends. And, and uh, so I got a bunch of my friends over to my Uncle Dan's house because I was so proud of my pastor, my uncle. And, uh, and it, it worked. I wanted them to see a Christian family. And it worked, and my one friend, I was sitting in the living room with them, and to this day, I, I, I've run into him a few times, but I, I hope now that he's walking with the Lord, I don't know. But I remember uh, he said, Dan, I know what you want. You want me to become a Christian. And he started weeping. And this is a guy, he was not an emotional guy, not an emotional guy at all. He was always sarcastic, always funny. He started weeping, and he was shaky. He said, I know it, and I know it's good, and I know it's right, but I just don't want it. In the, in the, you could see the spiritual warfare as he was saying, I, I deny it, I won't want it, even as he knew it was true. And he went on to talk, and he said, maybe someday before I die, but I don't want it. You know what? I did the right thing to share Jesus with him, to love this guy, still love him, would love to see him. Another time, this was in high school, I was sharing the gospel with one of my friends, and I was talking to him at school and at home, and we were on the phone. It was so exciting to me to be talking with people about giving their life to Jesus Christ. And this fellow was close. This fellow was close. And uh, his, suddenly his dad was on the phone. He was cussing at me. How dare you? Uh, you have no right to do this. Uh, you're just a punk kid. What do you know? And I thought right away, well, I think my job is to be respectful here. And Dad asked me to back off. I'm going to back off. But my buddy's going to be out of high school soon. Then I'm going right back in. And uh, I don't know where this guy is today. And I hope that he is right with the Lord. But he did pray with me. 
uh, after high school. He did pray with me and uh, with tears gave his heart to Jesus Christ. Uh, this fruit, how he's walking, that's between him and God. But, but I love him, and I hope to see him growing in his faith. Uh, another fella, businessman in Japan, and I was, again, teaching him English and Bible. He was uh, often came to class drunk. <laughs> and uh, he could not, he was an incredible stutterer, always stuttering. His face was always red. And he was just always lying. I mean, it was like the truth was difficult for him to see. He was like, why do you even have to lie about that? that, that that's not even, who cares? The truth or the lie, neither one of them mattered to me. And he, had, he had to lie about everything. And his handshake was this incredibly weak little thing like that. He was always, couldn't look you in the eye. He always was squinting, looking away. Shared the gospel with him over a period of months. And I'll tell you what. When he first started weeping, and when he first started really zeroing in, I thought, well, who knows if these guys, what, who, what kind of game is he playing? Finally, he got to the point where he did pray with me. And uh, he started coming to church with me, too. I'll tell you what, that guy stopped showing up drunk. More than that, I don't know how this happened. He stopped stuttering. He stopped lying, and he'd look you in the eye, and his handshake became firm. He got excited about Jesus. And I kept saying, you got to bring your wife. you got to bring your wife. He was afraid to talk to his wife. Then finally he says, you know, i gotta, got to tell my wife about this. I want her to go to heaven too. Uh, he was baptized. Didn't see him for a while. Then I heard a knock at my door, apartment there in Japan. He come to the door. Guess who was red-faced, drunk, stuttering, couldn't look me in the eye. <laughs> he's laughing because it's not funny, but he's, I told my wife about Jesus. She says she's going to leave me if I go to church anymore. <laughs> so I can't come. And I didn't fight for him then because I was young and stupid. I don't know whether his faith was ever real or not. I hope it was. I hope, I, I hope that fellow's in heaven with me. But the going got rough, and he ran away. Maybe I was just one of the dominoes. You know what? God's got grace even for weakness. Maybe he is saved and he was just too weak. I don't know. But I wanted to share you, show, share you these stories because sometimes uh, we're worried. We have this fear, like what if I share Jesus with somebody but they don't really get saved? Do you ever worry about that? Or we have this, this uh, tendency in Christianity where you hear somebody saved and Okay, I'm going to quiz them to see if they have all the right answers. Oh, I'm not sure they're saved. And they still have some trouble in their life, so maybe they're not really Christians yet. I want us to stop doing that. I want us to start just being eager to share the word. And then we will let time prove the fruit of it. And we will let God decide who really believes and who really didn't. I, everybody open their Bibles right now to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> Same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. And he told them many things in parables. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Then skip down to chapter 13. Skip down to verse uh, 18. Get to do 18 through 23. Chapter 13, 18 through 23. 
Listen to then to what the parable of the sower means. When people hear the message about the kingdom and do not understand it, the evil one, Satan, comes along and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed that was sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to people who hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the world, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to people who hear the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth work. Choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to people who hear the word and understand that they produce a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is really important to understand. And I think a lot of times, again, we're always, we always have this mindset that, well, what if I share and they're not really Christians? And we somehow feel like that's an embarrassment on ourselves or reflects on us. Or, or what if they fall away? Or what if, what if they're Christians but worries of life comes and their life never is fruitful? They never really show any fruit for the Christian walk. Uh, maybe when we get this idea, well, I'm just not going to do it. Or we're real skeptical of other people when they bring somebody to church. And, uh, hey, Donnie. And uh, we, we're just uh, really critical and judgmental. Brothers and sisters, it's not our job to determine what kind of soil a person is before we share with them. Nowhere in this parable is Jesus critical of the farmer for scattering that seed. You got it? Our job is to share our faith and, and scatter the seed everywhere we can. What kind of soil they are, how they receive the word, is between them and God. Don't worry. Well, I mean, we should be concerned. We want people to grow in their faith. But don't let that stop you is what I'm trying to say. Go, th go out there and start sharing Jesus. Sh scatter that seed with everybody you can. And don't get discouraged. We like those times when somebody comes to faith in Jesus and they take off and they're at every Bible study and they're growing their faith. And before you know it, they're sharing their faith to other people and they're leading people to Christ. We like those stories. And that's, that's the... That's the seed that you scatter, and it, it goes 30, 60, 100-fold. Isn't that fun? And, and those things happen, and we've seen those things happen. That's good. But don't just get discouraged if you share the seed and you thought they're a believer, but then the worries of life and the lure of wealth chokes it up, and they never have any fruit in their life. Uh, again, brothers and sisters, when we share our faith, and we do what we can to disciple them because Jesus Christ didn't want magic prayers, remember? He wanted disciples. Go and make disciples of all people. When we, when we scatter that seed and we try to lead people into a relationship with Christ, we're doing our job. Don't not do your job because you're worried about whether they'll become fully the person in Christ that they should or whether their faith was even perhaps not even real to begin with. What a person does with that gospel is their choice. Your job is to share Jesus. Got it? Everybody got it? Uh, so don't allow fear of bad soil or false converts keep you from sowing. I want to address another concern people who want to share their faith sometimes have. And I have to confess that sometimes I have this problem too. Uh, today, when you came in, Everybody was given a little book called The Four Spiritual Laws, right? Everybody have that? If you, don't have, if you didn't get one, raise your hand. All right, Moses needs one. Girls, do we have any more? They're all gone away. Who, uh, there, Michael has one, good. Uh, Toriano needs one. Anybody else didn't get a Four Spiritual Laws book? Sometimes in my life, especially when I was younger, I can remember when I was at uh, Parker, Parker High School. <clears throat> My kids are at Craig, otherwise I'd go yay Parker. Uh, I can remember when I was at, at, uh, at uh, high school at Parker that I would go to uh, Orfordville for Campus Life. And I guess a number of our people in our church were going to Milton to Campus Life, but I went the other direction. I went to Orfordville. And uh, the leaders there, they tried to teach us how to share our faith. And you know what? I was a little rebellious. I didn't like it. I was immature. And maybe, maybe some 
you've got some of the same spirit in you that I do. When I first saw these four spiritual laws for Campus Crusade, I thought, man, this is canned. This is fake. I just want to talk about Jesus from my own heart. And I did that. And uh, I was able to share with a lot of people and pray with a few people while still in high school. And, and then I went to Moody Bible Institute right down in Chicago. Wonderful school. They love Jesus. And they taught us, I had a class where they taught us about evangelism and how to write our testimony. And again, I thought, oh, I even looked down at people. Because of how arrogant I was, how stupid. Boom. Uh, oh, you need to put your testimony into a little nice bite size. Can't you just share from your heart? Can't you just talk about Jesus? How ridiculous. And I was so uncomfortable and rebellious. That poor teacher had a bonehead in his class. I was already sharing my faith regularly, and I didn't, thought I didn't need a canned approach, and I didn't need a, a bite-sized testimony. Those approaches seemed so generic to me, so standardized, too impersonal. And I stayed that way. And I was a missionary. I was a, a youth pastor in America. I was a, a missionary. I went to Trinity, and then I was I still that way. And I was a, a missionary in Japan, and then our church took a trip to Korea. And if you were here in Sunday school class, you heard me talking about it. We went to a campus crusade for Christ meeting in Korea, South Korea. 30,000 young people on fire for Jesus. It was phenomenal. And while we were there eating octopus tentacle soup for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, uh, sitting out on the ground in the beating sun and in the rain for 12 plus hours a day, they taught us how to use the four spiritual laws that little yellow booklet that you have to share our faith. And it hit me, and I broke down with tears that I had been so arrogant I was missing something. I was a person who was always sharing my faith. I don't think you need to use the four spiritual laws, okay? I'm not saying you have to. But what that booklet did for me was it step, 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 and then it provides an opportunity. And would you like to pray with me to become a believer? And I realized I'd been so big on apologetics, so big about trying to hammer somebody that this is obviously true, that I rarely, I had only prayed with a handful of people in my life to lead them to Christ at that point. Because I didn't ever, or I rarely came to the place and say, no, because they'd be nodding their heads with me. And I wouldn't say, and wouldn't you like to do this? Wouldn't you like to become part of the family? Wouldn't you like to follow Christ? Don't you want your sins forgiven? Why don't you pray with me? After I got a hold of that booklet, I went to Japan. <clears throat> In the next couple of years, I think I led over 30 people to Christ. Again, what they're doing with that today, different kinds of soil, I don't know. But I had the opportunity to pray with over 30 people. Uh, in the years since, I don't always use the four spiritual laws, but I often use the things that I learned from the four spiritual laws. And I gave you one today. I carried one in my pocket that I used for ages until... It finally became so tattered that it was falling apart. I carried you one today. Please don't take this and lay it on a toilet seat somewhere so somebody can see it at the mall. Uh, don't leave it on the table for a, for because these are you can do you can make your own. In fact, we're going to talk about that later. You can make your own cheaply. These things are thirty five cents a piece. Uh, but what I want you to do is keep a hold of this book, read through it yourself till you're comfortable with it. Keep it with you, in your purse, in your wallet, whatever. And when you're having that conversation, say, hey, you know what? Actually, I got a little booklet here. It really explains Christianity. We can go through it step by step. And it allows them to participate. Have them read it with you. Have them answer the questions. And don't, don't blitz past the questions. When it, it, there's a diagram in there of two circles. One circle has a throne with Christ in the middle, and one circle is with self in the middle. And then there's all these different things. Uh, your job, your careers, your, your relationships, uh, fun, uh, all these things orbiting, and say, well, how do you want your life to look? Do you want your life centered on God? Or do you want to be the king of your life? And I've been stunned. Sometimes I'm just going through the motions thinking I'm just part of a domino, and people tell me, yeah, I want this circle. Well, you know what? Then we can do something about that. We can pray together. In, in and so it is a good tool, and don't be like me or like I was, saying, well, that's too standardized, that's too generic, that's too, that's too whatever, I'm not going to use it. It's a beautiful tool. And you don't always have to use it, but you can use it. 
keep it with you. There will be opportunities. Pray for opportunity. All my life, when you pray for opportunity, God provides opportunities. I, I, I'm praying for you guys. God, give them opportunities. So keep a hold of that booklet. Keep a hold of that booklet. And when people ask for it, hey, can I have this? You can even tell them, no. But I'm going to get you one. I'm going to order you one. And that gives you another reason to meet with them anyways, another, another opportunity for contact. So I, I no longer look down at the short three-minute testimony. In fact, I'm going to teach you how to do that today. I've never been big with my testimony. I became a believer when I was four. Uh, but I really think there's a value to that. And, and also, I'm just naturally oriented towards apologetics and a reasonable thing. So I, I often talk about those things. But, but these are tools that are, anybody can use. Uh, this booklet, this Four Spiritual Laws, please keep it with you. And please pray for opportunities to read with somebody and go through the booklet. And you may, in fact, I'm counting on it. And in the days to come, in the months to come, when you lead somebody to Christ, or even when you have the opportunity to share with somebody, I want to hear about it. And we're going to do more sharing here on Sunday mornings. And I want to hear, I got a chance to talk to my friend about Jesus. And, and maybe they believed or maybe not, but we're going to share that so that the rest of us are encouraged. Oh, yeah, let's keep doing this. Let's keep talking about Jesus with everything. To me, it's no longer an either or. Either I talk from my heart or I talk from a booklet or, or give a short testimony. It's both and. We can use both of them. Uh, it's the same, uh, again, with preparing your testimony. You can do it any way you like, and you can, you can make an hour-long testimony. And if you've got people who will sit with you and, Listen as you talk for an hour, great. If you have somebody over uh, for the evening and they're with you two, three hours, you can really get into detail about your testimony. If you go out to eat with somebody, you can really get into detail. But there are going to be times when even a good friend, they're really not going to sit through it. Prepare the three-minute version so that you can give it to somebody while standing in line at the supermarket. Prepare the three-minute version and then you could always do the three-hour version anytime you want, but prepare the three-minute version. So if we could have the next slide, your three-minute testimony, you want to put the spotlight, put the spotlight on Jesus. There's a standard temptation, especially if you have a really cool testimony about, I, drugs are not cool, okay? But if you have a cool testimony about all the trouble you got into before Jesus, the temptation is to put the spotlight on yourself and say, look what a bad guy. And you're almost telling stories about how bad you were. Uh, keep putting the spotlight on Jesus Christ. Uh, talk about these things right here. And keep them short. So your life before Christ, less than one minute. And, and you might want to take notes. You might want to, you've all been given the, the, the what do you call them? Jessica makes them? Yeah. Bulletins. All right, well, if you have a place to take notes, or, or I'll send this out by email to everybody in the church, too. Uh, if you don't have email, you've got to get it. Before Christ, try to keep it short. You don't need to glorify all the sin you were in, but be honest about it. What was your life like? And if you spend too much time talking like, I had it all, my life was really clicking, I had a great job, and then I came to Christ, if, nobody's going to come to Jesus. What was your life like that made you want to become a Christian? Talk about that. What did your life orbit? It was all about money. It was all about uh, sex. It was all about popularity. It was all about being the coolest guy in the room. It was all about uh, making people think that I was this great intellectual or whatever. What did your life orbit? And how did this lifestyle let you down to the point that you thought, I've got to find out more about Jesus. I've got to know if there's something to this. Next part, a little bit more than one minute. How did you receive Christ? People need to be walked through this process. What, what does it mean? They, maybe they saw a movie, somebody fall on their knees and say, God, forgive me. But they need to know a little bit more about that. When was the first time you encountered, an authentic, uh, uh, encountered authentic Christianity? And I'm indebted to Crew's uh, website for this, by the way. Uh, Crew.org, crew Campus Crusade. Uh, when was the first time you encountered, uh, I, I changed it a little bit, but that's where it's from. When was the first time you encountered authentic Christianity? When did it first like, see, yeah, my stereotype about Christians, maybe it's not true. Or maybe in general it's true, but there's something legitimate here. 
Can you think back when you first started to think, maybe this is true? Maybe it came after you came to church here. Sometimes you think you're a Christian, but you're just going through the motions, and one day you finally hit me and say, wow, this really is true, and it really means a lot to me. And you, you realize somewhere along the line it became real to you. So when did you encounter authentic Christianity? What was your initial reaction? Like, whoa, there has to be, maybe you rejected it right away, or maybe you just jumped in right away. But what was your initial reaction to real Christianity? When did you start to come around? See, people need to be walked through the process so they can see how it could happen. They could visualize in their own life. What were some of your final obstacles to faith? Maybe an intellectual question that was answered for you. Or maybe you realized that you were just throwing dust in the air all along anyways. Or, or maybe you were afraid of what your family or parents would think. Maybe you were afraid of what your friends would think. What were the final obstacles to faith? Why, and now briefly, how did you accept Jesus Christ? And you could say, I finally just fell on my knees and prayed. Or you could say, I'm not even sure how it happened. I just realized one day, hey, I believe this. I believe everything about this. I'm singing in church, and I believe it. I'm praying in church, and I believe it. I'm reading the Bible, and I believe it. How, why and how briefly did you accept Jesus Christ? And, and you can use this, and if they're interested, you can go right into the Four Spiritual Laws booklet. See how that works? Uh, and then, uh, approximately one minute, how has your life been different since you gave control to God? Please be careful not to be Pollyannish here. Oh, it's so hunky-dory and everything's lined up and my grass is always green. I don't even have to mow it. It's just per uh, don't, don't, do not lie to share the kingdom of God. God does not lead, need your lies. Can we agree on that? Uh, so how has your life been different since you gave control to God? There's been ups and downs. You still have the struggles. Specifically, changes in attitude. But my life has a new orientation. But I have my hope in Jesus Christ. But when I feel myself let down, I realize I've got a Savior who's greater than me. So keep, keep it real. Keep it real. Uh, specific changes. What changes in lifestyle? Yeah, I knew I had to give up some things. Yeah, I still struggle with some things, but I'm not defending anymore. I know I'm a nasty person. I know I've got a bad attitude, and I want to do things God's way. What are your hopes? Some new, new value system, new hopes and new aspirations. Now I just want to live to, this has been so much to me. Now I just want to let everybody know about Jesus. Actually, that's why I'm giving you my testimony right now. Keep it real uh, and, and just talk about how your life has changed how your attitudes, lifestyle, hopes have become different since you gave your uh, faith, uh, gave your heart, gave your life to, to Jesus Christ. Uh, things to keep in mind while writing your testimony. I think we've got another. Another slide for that, yeah. And we've talked about these, so I'm just going to go through them briefly. Keep the spotlight on Jesus. Jesus is the hero and the star of your life story. If you just glorify yourself, for one, nobody wants to hear it. And secondly, you can't save them. You are not the Savior. And if they end up thinking you're really cool and really awesome, but that's all it is, uh, they're, they're still damned. They need to see that Jesus Christ is the hero and the star and the, and the Savior. Uh, second one, write the way you talk. Don't try to sound too religious. You don't need to use these and thous. And don't use Christianese, you know, the words like that we only use in church, that we don't use outside of the church. Uh, talk the way you talk with natural. Do you use everyday language? Uh, but don't swear. I mean, you should, you should set yourself apart by the kind of Christian you are. Uh, be honest about your sins, but keep it appropriate in this three-minute version for all ages and settings. Uh, you can say, I was really messed up, I was chasing women. You don't need to go into the gory details. Uh, you can say, I was, I was involved in drugs and it really beat me up. You, there's things you could talk about, but you don't need to go into the details. Depending on the situation, and again, you're with some people, uh, with some other men or with some other ladies, or something. you can go into more detail when you have more time. But there should be a three-minute version that confesses your sin without going into the gory details that would be inappropriate in some settings, okay? You're not, you don't want to be in Shopco talking about the nasty details. It's just wrong to, to the pe other folks. Don't bash other churches or Christians. This is a big one. You don't, you don't need, when you're making your testimony, instead of, saying, instead of saying, I went to some churches, and they were so ritualistic and dead and dry, and they never preached the truth. You can say, listen, you can say the same thing this way. 
I grew up going to church, but it never clicked with me. I never really got it. I really didn't understand what it meant. And then if they had the same experience, instead of getting defensive about their church, they're going to say, wait, that's me too. It's like I've seen people have a real relationship with God, but it wasn't me. And so you can say the same thing and actually help people closer to Jesus instead of being out there throwing other Christians under the bus. We don't enjoy the thump, 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 thump of other Christians being thrown underneath the bus. Uh, practice uh, reading out loud to your friends or family until it becomes natural. In fact, uh, you can just get a bunch of guys together and give each other's testimony one to another and, and keep it time, you know, keep it three minutes. You can always add more, it depends on the situation. Share the true gospel. Keep it real. Don't promise things the Bible doesn't. Uh, in this life, we will have trouble. Nobody wants a Pollyannish white picket fence, fake uh, faith anyways. Uh, quickly, a couple of my favorite tools are, I already talked about the cliff diagram from last week. You can draw it anywhere, on a napkin, back of an envelope, on your hand. Uh, you can just illustrate it in the air, draw it uh, with water from your side of your drink on the table. I've done all of these different kinds of things. You can talk about the separation we have from God. Humans are over here. Take your time with it. Talk about all the different. We can try philosophy. We can try religion. We can try being good enough. You can try earn enough money. You can try just leading a good life. All of them, God is so good. He's so perfect. We all fall short. But what we couldn't do, God could reach over. Share them the cross. Talk about taking, having faith to step out and accepting this gift. So I like, I like to use the cliff diagram. And again, you might not always have your four spiritual laws with you, or you can use it in conjunction with all these. I've done the, I've done the testimony cliff diagram into the four spiritual laws. You can use all three. Uh, and then I, my favorite verse to teach is from Romans 6.23. And if you have your Bibles, I know many of us have memorized it, but just turn there. Get the tactile feel of your Bible in your hands. Turn to, turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I, talk, I use this verse even with people who have never been in church and don't know anything about Christianity. And I've actually had other missionaries tell me when I was in Japan, you can't lead with this verse. You've got to talk about God loves everybody. You got, you can't, they're not going to understand these things. Well, guess what? This is what I lead with. I like this because it talks about our situation right away. For the wages of sin is death. And then I explain to people, I ask them, you know what a wage is? They say, yeah, it's like what you earn when you go to work. Yeah. Well, you, earn, you work hard, you get money. Well, our wages for sin, and sin is all the things that are opposed to the will of God. Sin is all the nasty things in our heart, you know, that darkness that uh, we even say and do things that hurt the people we love most. And I get into detail because people don't know what sin is. That's like another word. You've got to explain what sin is. You know how you hurt the people you love most? Oh, yeah. That's sin. You look around, you, isn't the world messed up? You turn on the news, isn't the world messed up? Yeah, it's messed up. And don't you know you messed up in here too? Yeah, I messed up. That's sin. And so you talk about it, the wage of sin is death. And what does death mean? Well, sin brings death of love, death of relationships, death of hope, death of purpose, and our lives start to feel empty. But I say mostly what this is talking about here, you know what it's really talking about? It's talking about hell. This is eternal separation from God. This is spiritual death. And so you go into all this stuff. So the wages of sin is death, but, and then I often say, but this is a big, beautiful but, but that's just me. You don't have to do it just the way Dan does it. But, but the gift of God, everybody's different, right? The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This gift freely offered, eternal life. And then you can talk about the cross and everything else right from this verse. So instead of dancing around talking about all the blessings we can get dancing around talking about how god loves you and you're special right away we jump at it right away we got a sin issue we got a death issue these are two tigers we can't fight we got to find somebody who can deal with the sin and the death and we can talk about the cross right so the the diagram and the romans 6 23 are two that i often like to use right off the bat to talk to people uh, what christianity is like one tool i don't uh, use alone, but sometimes I incorporate it into a larger discussion is the old from Evangelism Explosion, and did Dad use this recently to pray with somebody to lead to Christ within the last couple weeks? If you were this question, if you were to die tonight and go before God's throne, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, how would you answer? Because a lot of people say, well, I've been trying to be good. 
And then you can use that to say, you know what, nobody's good enough because God's standard is perfection. So depending on their answer, but a lot of people in America naturally say grace. Well, it's got to be grace. Then you could talk, unpackage that and talk about it, what it actually means. Listen, over 80% of Americans say they're Christian. You don't end the discussion because somebody says they're a Christian. And just because they know how to fill in the blank, grace, right? That's the right answer, right? You don't end the discussion there. You unpackage it. You work with people. You keep the conversation going. But that is a question that I think is, is a good question because it can reveal where people's hearts are. Uh, so another question I use sometimes when I'm talking to people who are, this is just a first step. When I know the conversation is not going to lead to them accepting the Lord that day, but they're really hostile and they're saying, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. I say, okay, I get that you don't believe there's a God. But, boy, I'll tell you what, answer me this. If there was a God and he loved you so much that he died for you and your, your life is messed up but he loves you anyways, wouldn't you just like to fall on his feet before his feet and say, I love you, thank you? <laughs> I want heaven. When, if, if there was a real God, and then you know what I often get? Huh, if the, even if there was a real God, I'd never bow my knee before him. And you could say, listen, I'm not going to hammer you, but maybe the problem is your attitude. You just don't want to help yourself to a living God. It, it's, you can give them something to think about. You can give them, because uh, that is another question that kind of opens up their heart so they can see where they're standing before God. All right, uh, I've got some more, but first I'm going to invite Rachel up for a bit to share something exciting that's been going on in her life, and uh, I want us all to be looking for opportunities. Come on up, Rachel. I want us all to be looking for opportunities to talk about Jesus, and Rachel's been doing that, the la uh, well, for quite a while now, and here's an example. Uh, she shared with me about this, and I said, oh, that's awesome. You got to tell our church about it, so come on up. So on Friday, I got the chance to um, do a Bible study with four women raised in totally atheist society um, from China. And I know a lot of you are praying for me. As I told my family, it went better than I feared and uh, worse than I had definitely hoped because I didn't get to pray with anybody on Friday. But I wanted to tell you guys how things have been going with those ladies and, and how I got to that point. I was thinking um, a little different than Dan. I... I, I love people, but I like to be alone very, very much. And so after Nehemiah was born, I was just loving the fact that I could be home with my kid, just me. And uh, I remember telling Chet, you know, if I don't get out of the house, I'm not going to meet anybody. If I don't meet anybody, I'm not going to be able to share the gospel with anybody. I mean, I would have much preferred to stay in the house, but... Because, you know, I really believe in heaven. I really believe in hell. I just so desperately want people to go to heaven, you know? You, you want them to Amen. know Christ. And, um, and so just the thought of people going to hell, you know, eternally separated from God, that's something when I know the answer, we got to do something about it. So I was just like, well, I'm a mom. What can I do? So I was like, I can start taking my kid to story time at Barnes & Noble. So I go to uh, story time, and I was... I was thinking, I was praying to the Lord, please give me an opportunity. And that's one of those kind of prayers my whole life. God's always been like, here's the opportunity. So I, I meet a, a Chinese lady there, and uh, we start chatting and talking, and I thought, here's, here's the opportunity. I'm going to take it. <laughs> so I start, you know, salting the conversation, um, uh, you know, about God and, and a Christian, what I believe in the Bible. And she uh, invites me to her Chinese mom's playgroup, and I'm part Chinese. My kid is part Chinese. I'm like, here's an opportunity. I'm going to take it. <laughs> my race. Who knew? But um, So I, I ended up going, uh, going there and meeting a lot of other ladies and uh, kept salting the conversation. And uh, she asked me, well, I'll teach you Chinese if you teach me English. And I thought, here's an opportunity. I'm going to take it. I said, sure. So I go to her house uh, once a week, and I taught her English out of the Chinese English Bible. So we can read the Bible together at the same time. So that goes on, and uh, turns out two of them are music majors, um, but from in China. I was a music major. I'm like, here's an opportunity. I'm gonna take it. They like singing karaoke together. Uh -huh. I say, okay. They say Rachel sing one. I'm like, okay. I look for Amazing Grace. <laughs> so I sing them Amazing Grace, and so you know this has been going on for a year. Gradually, I get to the point. 
Chet and I talked about, are we moving away or are we staying? And one of the things that we definitely talked about staying in Madison was, I have a connection with these ladies. Like, I'm building something here. We want to see these women get saved. I love them. And that was part of the decision to stay in Madison, was to stay near these women. So I get my house, and it's always been like a dream of mine. You know, talk about answers to prayer, a dream of mine to do ministry in my own house. I always had this really tiny, tiny apartment. So right away, I'm like, I've got a house. Come over to my house and do a Bible study. <laughs> it's like a new house. Opportunity, I'll take it. So they come over um, to my house, and the first Bible study, well, it didn't go so well. So that was, you know, the kids were crazy, everything. The second time, now their kids are, are doing daycare stuff, so we get together, but I want to tell you about another crazy situation. We get home, and there's mail on our front door with a Chinese name on it, and it's not us, you know? And, and, I, and I'm like, well, what was in common? There's nothing in common, hardly, but it turns out to be our neighbors who just moved in in the back. They just got there. So we take the mail over. It turns out the mom is from a similar area as, the other moms in the play group. And so there's another opportunity. I say, please come to my house for Bible study on Friday. And uh, so I got a knock on the door, um, and she doesn't want to come in the door, and she says, I'm, I'm Buddhist, I don't want to come in. And I said, well, please just come in and, and learn more. Well, I didn't, get her, I didn't get her to stay. However, mom had put together Chinese New Year bags, <laughs> and I was able to give her the whole packet of what we were going to talk about that day and a Chinese New Year bag. As soon as she saw the Chinese New Year bag, she went from really defensive to like, wow, thank you, <laughs> Chinese New Year. Um, and uh, so I was able to get into her hands the packet of everything that we were going to talk about that day. And she said, thank you, I'm going to read this. And actually, what we talked about on Friday was I had said, if you guys have any questions about Christianity, please bring them to me. And one of the ladies said, we were taught at school in China that God does not exist. So I want to hear, how does science and history work with the Bible? I'm thinking, what? This is like my favorite thing to talk about ever. <laughs> like, that's an opportunity. Sure, I'll take it. You know, like, thank you, God. So, um, so I put together this packet. We canvas science, you know, and, and, and how that, you know, points to the existence of God. And then we canvas history and the authenticity of, the, you know, the reliability of the Bible. And it's, you know, then I, I do some prophecy with them. It's, and it's so exciting. And then at the very end, of course, it's leading up to the, the gospel and something very similar to the four spiritual laws. And um, I didn't get to pray with anybody, but one of the ladies um, told me, like, I, I told my husband, I think the Bible has the words to clean the heart and the mind. That's a huge step. And, um, and then another one of the women said, next time I go to the museum, because um, she likes taking her kids to the museum, and my kids ask, where did I come from? Instead of just saying, monkeys, we all know that. She said, I think I might say, maybe it's God. And so things are progressing, and I really thank you guys for the, the prayers and just for my opportunity to, from God to be able to talk to these ladies. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, since we started this series, two people in our church have prayed with others to be saved. And uh, I've had three opportunities in person uh, to talk with people about Jesus in our church just since this study has been started, including a person Yumi and I had over at our home this week, and Yumi invited her to church. And I've shared my faith numerous times, of course, on Facebook. And others in church have told me about people that they've invited. Dad ran into a guy yesterday in the store and invited him to church. See, this is what we're talking about. It's not awkward when it's your passion. Share your passion. If your passion is Jesus, you're naturally going to talk about Jesus. It's not weird. It's natural. Uh, it's will pour out of us when it's filling up us up on the inside. And Jesus commanded us to take this message, and he's the boss, so we say yes, sir, and we go. Uh, what Rachel's doing is great. Whether uh, she gets the harvest, and I think she may, or she's just one of a long line of dominoes, again, she's doing the right thing. Whether these women turn out to be good soil or not, again, that's between them and God. She is still scattering the seed of the gospel, and God is pleased when we scatter those seeds. Okay, uh, last part. Chet got me thinking, and, and you can take notes on this in your, what are those things called? Bulletins that we don't have. Uh, Chet, bulletins is a word that I often struggle with. For some reason, over the years, I'm 
typing into the computer. I can't remember the word. I can't remember the word. Uh, it's an odd word. But I remember the word bullet, and sometimes that helps me. Uh, Chet got me thinking that we need to encourage uh, following up on this series, uh, this months-long series on evangelism we had. And so uh, next, next slide, please. He suggested assignments. And I would like to say that as you do these assignments, let me know. And even if you just invite somebody to church and they don't come, stand up and say, I was so blessed. I was praying to share. And this week, I was able to tell three different people, why don't you come to church with me? And that, we're all going to be excited about that because we're, it's good to see people uh, sharing their faith, uh, just like Rachel did. So uh, here's number one, that, that testimony I just taught you how to write, that three-minute testimony. Write your testimony. I hope everybody in the church does this. I mean, be serious about it. Go ahead and do it. Uh, and maybe we'll have a few people come up and share their testimony, okay? And, and we'll do that maybe during announcements or, 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 I don't know, maybe an evening service, do a bunch of them or something. But uh, write your three-minute testimony. It's going to say, say, talk to God about it. God, I want this tool. I want to share how you came into my life. God, you've been, if Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, let's do what we can to share this message with other people. Secondly, invite one person you know to church this week. This is like easy. This is the ground floor, and, and I know everybody in our church is always inviting people to church, but do it again. For next Sunday, uh, March 1st, it, we're beginning the book of Luke next week, so it's a perfect start. Just invite somebody. Invite somebody to church next week. And then somebody you know. And then the following week, invite some random person you know. That's a little bit higher bar, but maybe just knock on the neighbor's door. You don't talk to him. You just say hi. Uh, maybe somebody that you're in. Remember I told you a story about how I was in line at the post office, and that led to a whole bunch of people come to church. Uh, just somebody you run into, invite them to church. Get used to talking to you to, about your faith. So that's next week. Next week, what are we all going to do? Everybody in this room? Invite somebody we know to church, right? And then the following week, we're going to see if we can all invite some random person to church. Number four, you can do this tonight, today. You can do it next week, whatever. But that testimony that you write, the short three-minute version, use social media to share that. And if, you're, if you don't have a computer, write a snail mail letter and send it to somebody. But uh, post that on Facebook or, well, I don't know what else there is. You can record yourself and put it on YouTube. Uh, or if you don't, if you're not on those things, you can you can just send it off to everybody you know on on, uh, on uh, email or whatever. But so write your testimony, and then you know what that verse we talked about. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the power of uh, for salvation first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Let people know you're a Christian, and you say nobody cares if I put that on Facebook. Listen, your job right there is if somebody has something in their life, if, if they have a spiritual need, if they come to a point in their life where they're struggling, they're going to know you're the person to talk to, okay? So let it be known. Let them know that you're standing for Jesus Christ. They could, maybe they'll say, what happened to you? I thought you were always a Christian. Say, yeah, you know what? Something just really clicked, and I felt like I had to do this now. It just made more sense to me. It's, something that I, it's just in my life, it becomes so important to me now that i got to share it. Uh, fifth, talk about Christ with somebody maybe either at work or in the neighborhood. So this is not just an invitation to church, which is easy, low bar. This is actually talking about Jesus. Talk about the cross. Talk about salvation. Maybe a coworker, a friend, or a new acquaintance. Maybe even if there's an opportunity, you can use that three-minute testimony. Number six, I'd like you to single out somebody. We talked about Facebook is the shotgun, right? You just scatter the gospel seed. This one, I want you to target somebody. And you could send an email, but you know an actual physical letter that you can hold on to, maybe come back to in the years to come. Just think of somebody, maybe it's a dad, maybe it's a father-in-law, maybe it's a strange child, maybe it's an old friend from school, and you know they're not living for Jesus. Think of somebody, write somebody that's, that maybe is not a Christian, maybe they are, you're, you're, that's not sure, Include these four basic principles of the gospel. Remember, we always said it's not just a bunch of happy-go-lucky uh, unicorns and, and everything's happy. Talk about the fact we're all sinners, right? Talk about the fact that none of us can save ourselves. It's like the old Bugs Bunny thing. You fall off a cliff and you can't, 
You pull yourself up, that doesn't happen in real life. When you're drowning, you can't just pull yourself up. You need somebody to save you. So, so we're all sinners, one, we can't save ourselves, two, Jesus died for our sins, take care of them, three, and then number four, by faith, you can get right with God. You can have that sin forgiven. You can have eternal life. So include all four elements, and then include an invitation to actually follow Christ. And, and maybe, even again, might be a good place to put that testimony that you've written, right? Because everybody's going to write that three-minute testimony. Include that in a letter. Isn't this powerful? And I want you to tell me, what's your good reason for not doing these? Lazy is not a good reason. <laughs> what's our good reason for not doing these things? How fruitful have we been? And if we're praying for opportunities, let's, let's get out there, get moving, and let's see what God providing us with some opportunities. So bonus assignment. Did I write that one? Yeah, bonus assignment. Create a handmade flyer briefly telling your testimony, including an invitation to church. You can make them as small as a, on, a, on a little note card. Or you, or you can make it a full paper. Just print up a bunch of them and give them to some folks. Uh, you know, the, the business card even. Uh, create a small handmade flyer briefly telling your testimony, including an invitation to church. Hand them out either to people you know or random people downtown or whatever. Uh, I've... I think at least four or five times the Janesville Mall has called me and said, tell your people to stop doing stuff. So don't do it in the Janesville Mall. They get ticked off. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but there are other places and other opportunities, and we can talk about Jesus, and you can share that. So, yeah, if you have any questions about those, get back to me. But brothers and sisters, let's do these, and then let's stand up here, and everybody can share, I invited somebody to church this week, and here they are, you know, or or, or uh, I was able to share my, God, my testimony with my parents, and they didn't even know I was a Christian, or whatever the case may be. Uh, let's, let's get out there and, and get this done. And I, I really want to finish right now with some prayer. So in your heart, remember, the prayer is not part of the lecture, and the prayer is not magic. In your heart, echo the words I say. Pray them in your own heart. Talk to the living God. And we're going to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come over us so that we can accomplish his mission to reach our city, okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, here we are. And uh, some of this stuff is kind of scary. For some of us, this is brand new. Some of us, Lord, maybe have been thankful for your salvation for many years, but haven't taken that step of sharing it. Maybe some of us have spent so many years sharing your faith without fruit that we kind of just gave up. Dear Lord God, far beyond what can be accomplished in a sermon or a Sunday morning service, Lord. Lord God, please send your Holy Spirit. Please break our hearts. Whatever resistance we have, Lord, please break it down. Humble us, Lord. Help us to surrender to you. And Father, help us to really love people, to care about people. People who are different than us. People who are, are lonely and hurting. People who are acting like lonely, hurting people. Uh, people who have been abusive towards us in the past. Lord God, Please give us opportunity and give us a, uh, courage to seize those opportunities. Father, I pray that everyone in this church will have a chance to not just invite somebody to church, which I pray we all do, not just talk about Jesus, which I pray we all do, and not just be one of those dominoes. And if we do those things, Lord, I know you're pleased, but Lord, we're greedy for harvest. We're greedy for souls. Lord, I pray that everybody in here has the joy of being able to pray with somebody, lead them into your kingdom, Lord. And then, Father, help us to disciple people, teach them everything that you've commanded, Lord, teaching them what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. God, you died. You died because you so loved this world. We're your children. You call us to be Christ-like, to be like your son, Jesus. So, Father, I pray that we're so like Jesus that we've got to take this message that we've got to share the cross, that we're so filled up with appreciation towards you, Lord, that it just naturally spills out of us to talk about Jesus and talk about the cross. And Lord God, we pray for a vast harvest. We pray for this city. Lord God, give us this city. I pray that we outgrow this building, Lord. But most of all, Lord, regardless of how people take it, I pray that you find our church faithful. Help us to scatter that seed everywhere we go. Lord God, we need your help. We love you. Help us to love you so much more and show you our love by being obedient 
to your great commission. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just... Uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area, and I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.